Welcome to Leadership and People. This is a series that pulls back the curtain on leadership by interviewing CEOs, senior executives, and entrepreneurs who've had large exits. We ask these experts about how they built trusted networks to rapidly grow their companies and what advice they wish they knew if they could do it all again. Today on the show, I've got Randy Garn. When you when you think about some of your favorite leaders, they didn't even they don't even care about the credit. Like I don't even care if people really know if I exist or want to i don't i don't need the credit i want to build up right now in my career like i want to help randy thanks for making time man it's great to be with you jess so you've done a few things um you i understand you got a new york times best-selling book is that right yeah we did we hit uh hit new york times bestsellers uh 2010 and 11 and uh we've also helped uh, helped a lot of people with getting their books out and content and so uh, I, I love uh, writing. I love education. So so you've built a company. You, you're in private equity now. You're helping other tech businesses. Well, first, tell us uh, tell us about your book and the best place for somebody to check that out. Yeah, we uh, we wrote a book called Prosper, um, Ethan Willis and I, and uh, we work closely with you know Ken Blanchard and wrote a book with him called The One Minute Entrepreneur. Um, and so you can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's, it's just, it's prosper is the name of the book. And it's, it's really kind of the whole thing about how to balance, how to, how to balance, um, money, happiness and sustainability. And, um, it was a ton, ton of fun writing it. And really it helps you to self-reflect and say like, man, how do I, how do I do those things? Cause the book really is about, you know, a lot of people that we probably know have had really good success at making a lot of money, but they're miserable. Um, there's other people that are really happy but don't have a lot of money, and there's also a lot of people that you know are like grasshoppers, great on takeoff. You never know where they're going to land, and so we really the, – the term prosper is actually multidimensional. It's a combination of how to balance money, making money, having fun, and doing it over a long period of time, and that's when you really have sustainable growth and satisfaction in your life. So that's kind of the premise of it. But yeah, you can get it on Amazon. It's just prosper, Randy yeah. Garn. That's great. And so um, nowadays, uh, you're obviously doing private equity with Greerco, uh, spending a lot of time with, with sounds like one of your portfolio companies, Scipio. Can you tell us what that's about? Yeah, we have, a, we have a, an amazing company. Um, kind of like if you ask me what I've spent my 10,000 hours in, you know, and what my real core competency is, it is one, growing people and, and helping other people see more and do more in themselves. My dad was a high school football coach for for 29 years and kind of growing up in the whole coaching space. And, you know, we build a, we build a pretty, you know, one of the largest coaching and training companies in the nation from 99 to 2012 and, and had a blast doing that. But right now, Scipio is, um, I love watching for things that are, that are really hot in the tech space and, and especially in marketing and communications and to grow any company, you got to be able to communicate well with your, with your customers. Right. Um, so we built a uh, uh, we 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 built a company called Scipio, and it's actually a tech mobile marketing company. And so, not as you know, not not a lot of people are reading email anymore, right? There's certainly an avalanche of it. <laughs> yes. So I mean, open rate on email as um, 2017, it's 2018 now, is about 12 percent. And so we we we're teaching people how to utilize um, mobile marketing text and voice broadcasting appropriately with SMS and MMS. So that's kind of the, uh, it's a text-based mobile marketing company to, for customer acquisi- acquisition, customer communication, client retention, all that fun stuff. So it's, it's exploding and, and a ton of fun. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, and tell us about uh, the business you built and sold. So um, there's been several. We did a c- company called Prosper. We, we built that up and uh, – and um, it was a, a ton of fun. We had you know, well over 700 employees and, and uh, had uh, clients in 80 different countries, um, had a pretty large, built up a pretty large database of, you know, well over 2.4 million people. Um, and uh, so, so that, was a, that was a ton of fun to really grow that and, and, uh, and learn a ton there of, man, how you take a company from, you know, zero. We, we bootstrapped that thing from the very beginning. And so it was just growing every single person, you know, from one of our, one of our, one of my favorite employees, um, Jade started in customer care and became our chief marketing officer because he kept learning and growing. And so that was a, it was a ton of fun growing that. And the people that I'd met and fostered through that are still, 
still really good friends and actually doing business with us today with the uh, with Skippy on the mobile marketing company. So it was a huge success and a ton of fun. Yeah, no kidding. Well, um, you know, the show here, Leadership and People, obviously being involved in multiple businesses, there's a lot of both those things. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about maybe early mistakes that you made in leadership and what you found works in the end, <clears throat> is there anything that comes to mind right off the bat? Yeah, I mean, a lot of things. Um, I think as, as a leader, in the very beginning, you know, to, to scale, and we've already, always heard the, the saying, you know, if you want to go – if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far and go big, build a good team. I think in the early stages when I was young, I mean, we, we started uh, our first company when I was a junior junior in college and won Entrepreneur of the Year and, and you know, built that and ran that for the next 14 years. And so when you, when you start out and you do that, um, you think you have to do it all. And you actually, and I, and I will say some of the things like, I love the recognition of the growth. Hey, oh, look at all the success you're having and look at all all that you're doing um, to you, you shift that to really being like, man, how can I give others recognition and how do I get out of my own way? And the more people like that law of reciprocity, the more people I can help that work for me to have success, the more successful the whole company is going to be. Um, so right now we, uh, you know, for, after I sold that, we did, we built a company called the, 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 the hero club and we had, you know, hundreds of CEOs that we were working with on strategy, innovation, you know, ideation. And this is what I would work with them on. I'd say, okay, guys, we, you got to build your team. Um, and even if you're going to sell your company or have a private equity company come in and buy it or VC, they're going to buy the team. They are not going to buy your product or service. And I don't know if you've seen that, Jess, and because I know that you, you, you ran private equity groups and, and different things, but is that not the case? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, a product and and you know future cash flows are what people get interested in to begin with, right? Yep. But I think um, I think what happens is most of us we get at least this was the case for me we get won over by a deal where we're yep. like we're kind of lying to ourselves a little bit about the people, and we're thinking, yep. oh no, we'll be able to manage them, we'll be able to keep it in line, it'll work out. Look at how great this deal is. And uh, in my experience, those have been some of the biggest financial regrets in my life, right? Yep. Yep. And uh, I think maybe it's the maybe maybe there's plenty of people smarter than me that don't do that in the first place. But uh, I'm guessing there's a few folks like me that they get in it for the deal at first, thinking uh, you know they can handle the less than stellar people or or the things that they're trying to convince themselves are just fine about the people involved, and uh, never seems to pan out in my experience. Exactly. So, I mean, to have a really, you know, the difference between a, a really big company, let's say, you know, a four $20 million company is you might have a really good product or you might have a really good team that's really good at marketing and sales, but to build, you know, a $400 million company or to have a tremendous exit, both of those have to come together. And as soon as I learned that, that you, you literally have to be really, really good at, um, four things. And, and my four things are four P's. And we teach us a lot. It's, it's product. You, know, you have to have the right price point. You have to have the right promotion and marketing materials. And you have to have the right people. And I really do think that, that people are, in any, any circumstance, are the very, very most important thing. And you have to spend so much time on growing and building your people if you want to build a very, very successful enterprise. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch is, is what they're said. But, but I always say that culture and strategy together freaking rock. Um, if you, if you execute well. Yeah. When you think about, um, you think about how many people pay lip service to that type of messaging versus the folks mm -hmm. that actually do it. Yep. Um, why do you think it's such a temptation for all of us to give into the short term win of, well, let's just get it done and we can build our team skill set later or we can invest heavier in, in training and mindset later. I, I think that I, I think it has to do honestly a lot with um, with maturity, um, you know, real real business maturity and and emotional IQ is what I call it. Um, 
right now, I mean, when you when you think about some of your favorite leaders, they didn't even they don't even care about the credit. Like I don't even care if people really know if I exist or want to. I don't I don't need the credit. I want to build up right now in my career. Like I want to help. You know, the a, a young man that we're working with now. He came and saw what we were doing and fell in love with what we were doing. He like picked up. He drove all the way from Denver just to come be with us. And then he said, Hey, I'll move my whole family out here and be here. And now I want to build him up. You know, I, I think that, I think that a lot of people do give lip service to it. Um, I think there's, there's a few really good ways that I've learned. I mean, really good case studies in, in helping people. It's really important to give recognition where recognition is due. And I don't think a lot of leaders do that as well as they, they could and should. But I also think it's also arranging compensation in a way that really gets them engaged and involved. Um, I think comp plans are just as important as, as recognition. Again, and you got to hit those two things both, that that recognition and saying, hey, good job, and the pat on the back and the nice email or the recognition at the Christmas party with their wives is fantastic. But I think if you align compensation around production – and around um, around production and and success, then you're going to get you're going to get a, a really good employee that actually feels really engaged as well. Yeah, you know, I'd love to talk about that for a second because when I think about a number of our consulting firms clients, it is a question that comes up a lot: is people feeling a little bit lost on compensation? Like, and I think <laughs> the worst one is sales teams. Yeah. Like, uh, I've had a lot of conversations and, and then we go through it ourselves in our own firm of like, man, we want to be, we want to pay well. We want, especially with, you know, sales being one of the, you know, very few ca job categories where compensation, you know, has been tied to higher performance, right? Like mm -hmm. you read a book like drive by Daniel Pink and they say, Hey, once they're making as much as they'd make elsewhere, it stops having quite as much impact and meaning and autonomy and these things have a bigger impact. Right. But yep. sales is one, you know, per part manufacturing and sales is one where they say, okay, those two, we actually do see higher performance with the higher pay. And uh, I'm interested in your thought process of whether it's setting up your own or whether you're advising portfolio companies on that balance of security and commissions and, not incentivizing selfishness and how do you get them to still be part of the team? Any inter interest in any thoughts you have about navigating that conundrum sometimes? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a few ways that, that you can do it. Um, I know, and, and working with your team and, and sharing with them is like kind of, if you look at profit per employee, right. And, you do that just by dividing, you know, your profit divided by the amount of employees that you have, because, I love it when, when somebody asks me is like, Hey, how many, well, how many employees do you have? You know, if they have a thousand employees, does that mean that that company's successful? Um, or if they have 50 employees, what if you have, you know, I'm, we're working with, with one company has about 16 employees and is doing $24 million in revenue. Um, you know, you look at that profit employee between that and a company that's doing 17 million in revenue and has 300 employees. Um, you know, and so you can align compensation in such a way, and it depends on what industry you're in and, and things like that. But one of the ways that you could do that is just do a little bonus plan each quarter around profit per employee. And I really do believe things that are measured will make an impact, and especially if there's something tied to that. And so even if it's small, even if you do something where it's each quarter, somebody gets 100 bucks or $50 and you say, hey, good job on that, and there's something tied to that, both economically and recognition, because that is recognition. Um, but I think that there's there's ways that you can do that simply uh, by that profit per employee, um, uh, by that profit profit by employee ratio, and come up with maybe a scaled tier uh, uh, pricing on how you do that and how you compensate accordingly. So you could do that from the receptionist down to your business development guy to your engineer. And so that everybody's aligned in the success of the company. Yeah, that's interesting because specifically for sales, you know, historically it's so much, what did you do? Right. Right. And right. you can end up with, uh, you can end up with sales teams that have got 
somebody posting really big numbers, but basically abusing the rest of their coworkers, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, well, um, let's talk about, uh, thinking about subjects like this. Um, let's take it to when you're evaluating an investment, when you guys are choosing another SaaS company that you're thinking about getting involved with, um, mm -hmm. what kind of things are you looking at compensation wise and, um, whether they're overpaying, underpaying and, and how do you evaluate stuff like that as far as, uh, the attractiveness of an investment for you? Well, and I think, I think when you, when you, when you look at a, when you look at, um, a company, we just, we just acquired a company out of Dallas, Texas. Um, and you know, most of the team has now moved out here and you know, the, the CEO who was the CEO of that company that was acquired is, is now, you know, working with us and he's got his hands in his meatloaf in the meatloaf going strong and continuing to build the company. And, um, I was nice cause we, you know, once you acquire it, we actually were able to give him a little bit of a raise from what he was doing because he was bootstrapping so much and putting everything back in the company and we were able to give, you know, more and to, and to stabilize that and to get him a place where he's like, Hey, I don't have to worry about anything else. I'm just going to now focus and grow this company. Because before, when he was doing it, you know, he's taking a fifty thousand dollars salary and then pumping all of the profit back in. But we were able to come in, do a little bit of a liquidity for him, and then also then, you know, do do a, a, a much better salary, and then now continue to grow the company. And so I think that that's why you need to look at, you know, and especially in the SaaS based services, if you're trying to bootstrap, again, you need to look at, man, how fast do I need to grow this? is my economic, we, we look at the economic engine of the company first and foremost, is like, you know, is it a solid product? Is it in the right space? Um, can we continue to get the right engineers and software to grow? Um, and then, and then, then let's look at the compensation of the team, where we are able to come in and acquire that and then, you know, give everybody a lift. And now that's just running hard. And so it is, it, it's different. You run it differently when when you're able to really do that, but then you got to now, now align on performance. Okay, guys, we're upping everybody's, you know, increasing people's salary and we're, we're doing this, but now we have to run hard. Now we've got to perform, we've got the resources needed and now we're going to, you know, grow this thing from, you know, a million to 15 million in, in two years. And so, so, so that, specifically with that, <clears throat> let, let's talk about that one for uh -huh. where you guys are, I mean, it sounds like you're trying to change the pace of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, what's, a, what's a tangible thing? Like, let's say somebody listening today is saying, okay, we, we have kind of hit that milestone and now we do want to, we want to accelerate our team to that next level. Any like tactical examples of, of what that looks like structurally or is there a scoreboard on the wall or, or what's an example of, of helping them run at that faster pace? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a good example. I mean, that we did, you know, that we did back. I mean, and this is kind of for sales specifically. Is, you know, sales it, it's it can be an individual sport, right? But we were able to, you know, we had actually hundreds of sales reps. We were able to break them into uh, pods of you know eight to ten with a manager over them, where before everybody was just kind of on commission based. Um, you know, uh, base salary plus, you know, commissions of what they, what they did. We, we actually started to gamify it and we put them in and I've actually seen, you know, groups of, you know, six to 10 work really, really well with a manager. And what we did is we said, okay, here's, here's, you know, here's your base, here's your commissions. And then we said for your team, if you guys hit these different levels in sales volumes, then we'll give an extra 2% kicker that shared with everybody, but according that shared with your whole team, but according to um, how much revenue you brought in. So if somebody brought in $10,000 in sales and somebody brought in, you know, $48,000, it would be Perry Passu on how much of that 2% they would get, but everybody would get a little kicker. So it became a really good team effort to have great success. And so, but it was again on what they, they were able to do. And then, so, I mean, doing fun things like that where there's a team incentive um, and breaking them into teams so that there's more teamwork and effort, that worked really, really well for us. And then we just exploded once we kind of came up with that that compensation structure. 
Interesting. Uh, anything besides the structure to help people want to bring more of that team feeling to work on a, you know, something that can be an individual sport like that? Um, you know, it's, it, it is, um, yes, we do. I mean, not just, and I, and I'll go off the compensation to actually doing team incentives. I, I do a lot of training, a lot of work on, on really kind of experience economy and, you know, we'll take our, we'll take our sales team out and go, go shotgun shooting, um, for the day or, you know, do it, do an incentive, whoever does the, the best, or we'll take our executive team, you know, out skiing. We just had, um, we just had Mark Eaton come into our office and we hired Mark Eaton to come in and he talked about the four, he talked about the four winning, the four, uh, commitments of a winning team. And his, his last two commitments were basically you have to, you know, recognize others and, and get out of your own way and no one to pass the ball off to somebody. And his, his last one was, um, you know, take care of your teammates, you know, have loyalty. And the more you build people up in that. So Mark came in here and talked just recently, actually on Monday about, you know, culture and about teamwork. And so we, we do, we bring, we bring a guest speaker in every single month, every month we bring somebody in that focuses on culture, that focuses on teamwork, that focuses on growth. And so also keeping the, um, I think keeping the, the employees really, you know, in, in the right mindset and things is really, really healthy. And so we, we actually invest quite a bit in training and a quite a bit in leadership along with in aligning that compensation. Yeah. You know, I'm interested in that subject for a minute because I think it's easy for people to feel like, um, on the outside bringing in, you know, Mark Eaton for people that don't know, you know, um, such, such a, wasn't he a hall of fame for like second most amount of rebounds in NBA history or something like that? Yeah. I mean, the guy's just ginormous heart, ginormous person. He's seven foot four. If you go to seven foot com. But yeah, he just wrote a, wrote a new book that's actually going to be coming out uh, um, in April, and he kind of shared everything with us. But yeah, Mark Mark is just he's humble, he's amazing. He was an auto mechanic, and you know they found him underneath the the, the hood of a car, and they played for UCLA, and then he went on to be the NBA's all time shot blocker. Um, and the guy the guy's just awesome. But he inspired everybody to kind of basically said, quit thinking about yourselves. The more you give, the more you're going to get. And he shared real stories with a coach that brought him under his wing. He would have never played in the NBA. His dad didn't believe in him. And now he had one of the most successful careers of all times. But he said once he learned how to play a team game, even the Utah Jazz were horrible. They were horrible. They couldn't even get people into the – they couldn't even get people to the stadium. He said when he started there was maybe three to 4,000 people max at each game. And they were all just playing an individual game. And so he came in and shared with us the coach's philosophy. Frank Layden came and shared with us. He's like, guys, you guys aren't the best players, but we're going to be the best team. And honestly, like it the, for this whole week, our guys have been working together. We've been breaking records. They've been discussing what he shared with us. Um, you know, so it, it has been it has been phenomenal. Because now people's mindsets are in the right place. And that's so important to, that your employees feel, you know, both engaged and that you're investing in them and that they're, that they're watching out for one another. And so when you have a company that literally cares about one another and wants each other to succeed and, it, and you get away from that just one-on-one -on -one plane, whether it's the engineer team or the sales team or the marketing team, where everybody's working together, where the marketing team goes, man, if I don't do this well, then our sales guys aren't going to have the materials they need to sell. And then the product team's like, man, if I don't get this product done by May 1st, then they're not going to be able to do this event, right? And so it's it's when you work together that that you see some some really good magic happen. So we had Rob Schallenberger on leadership come in the month before that. And then we've got another guy uh, we had uh, Dave Horsager. He's talks about the speed of trust come in. Uh, he's coming in next month. And so, you know, he speaks to the UN and all over. And so, I mean, we, we really, really believe in, in educating our employees and, and helping them really learn from the greatest thought leaders. That's great. Well, listen, I think it's a good part to end part one of the episode. Um, 
before we go, uh, where, where's a good pe- place for people to check out what you guys are doing? Is it go to Scipio.com or what's what's the best link for somebody? Yeah, um, it, it'd be awesome if, if you uh, want to check it out. It's really hot uh, tech that's that's growing like crazy. If you just go to Scipio.com, S-K-I-P-I-O.com is the best place to go kind of check out what we're doing. And, and uh, we have it right now so you can go in and get a demo if you want to go in and get a demo of it. But it's a, a really fun uh, really fun technology. Very cool. Okay. Thanks for making time. Awesome. Thanks, Jess.